and welcome back to another stud story. Uh, we had the last episode, number 26, was about Australia. And uh, I kind of call that one deadly Australia because a lot of things in that country are key. It's a pretty dangerous place to live uh, besides the sharks and the snakes and the spiders and whatever else. Uh, rockfish, uh, blue, blue, uh, blue uh, octopuses. I mean, wow, it, it was a whole lot of things there that you really had to watch out for. But uh, I want to do, do another one on Australia, but uh, I, I want to call this one uh, Delightful Australia. Some of the good things that uh, happened while I was in Australia for a couple of months. And uh, just uh, to, uh, to, to show the good side of that country because, wow, those are, it's a beautiful place. Uh, if I had to live in any other country other than this uh, in the United States, uh, I would certainly pick Australia. It's just a fantastically beautiful country, great people. Uh, in fact, uh, I just start there, uh, the first day that I uh, got there, first time that uh, the, the, uh, Jim Barnett, my bar, Jim Barnett, uh, the promoter, uh, sent me out with his boy, Lonnie. Lonnie took me and my wife, and I had two sons. One was about uh, t two years old, the other just born, six months old maybe. And uh, so they took me to get an apartment. We found an apartment and uh, we went down to shop the very first day. It was about the first, we wanted to get something to put in the, in the cook food at the house and that type of stuff. We'd been on the road, it took take two days just about to get to Australia and another couple to get back. And anyway, we went down, down and we expected to go in a grocery store. Well, we got down there, there was no grocery store. There was a butcher and then next door to the butcher was a baker and then next door to that, there was another store. It was like the canned goods and kind of a little, little grocery. So that was a kind of odd experience. You know, you used to going into the store and getting everything out of the one store. So uh, we end up going in last to the, to the butcher. We got a little canned goods. Uh, we got some bread in the bakery. And then we went next door into the butcher. And uh, so the butcher, I said, you know, we want a nice cut of meat. We want a roast or something like that. And he goes, oh, Mike, uh, what kind of roast do you want? You know, and I said, well, uh, well what, what kind do you got? What do you suggest? And he says, I'll be right back. And he went, and, uh, he went into a little room. He opened up the door, and there was a rail that went along the roof and it went back into the, into the meat lock. And uh, he, he was gone for a couple of minutes. So I was like, well, what, what is he doing at back there? And then he comes out, he has his shoulder stuck in the side of it. He has a side of beef all the way from the hoof all the way down to the shoulder. And he's shoving it on that rail. He brings it right out in front of you. It's like five feet away. He goes, uh, well, what do you want, mate? What kind you want, you know? And I said, really, I don't know, man. I'd never seen it the meat in that, in that shape, in that form. So, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know what to say. We said, well, how about a rump roast? He said, well, how do you want, mate? You want a pound, two pounds, whatever. I said, give me a couple of pounds. And he takes the knife and he just jams it in the butt of this big piece of hunk of meat, man. It's a whole side of beef. And he cuts out a big hunk and throws it on the, and I'm like, wow. This is crazy, man. And, you know, so uh, when we went to the, uh, the 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 regular grocery store, the guy says to us, "When we get ready to leave, we I said, and, you know, I'm waiting." I said, Are "You gonna sack up the groceries?" He goes, "No, nah, mate." Because the way you did, and I gave him the address, and he says, uh, "We're gonna bring it to you." And I was like, "You gonna bring it to us?" You know, my, so you know, it was such a different country. So we got back home. And uh, got a knock on the door in about 15 minutes and go to open the door. And the guy, uh, he goes, he steps in the door and he goes, uh, where's your kitchen, mate? And, you know, I said, well, it's back over there. You know, I was wondering, what, are you, what, is, what do you want to know? You know, and he just goes right on in. And he starts putting the food in the cabinets. He don't just take them out, put it on the, he starts putting your food away. You know, it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, so, uh, and this was 1973. And there was, there was quite a bit of difference between America, the way, the way we were doing business and what it was in Australia during that time frame. Uh, so uh, we had another 
deal with the heck store. It was a little bigger store. And I remember going into it one time to shop and they had uh, two, three registers. I think it was three registers and, uh, and they had uh, lines in all three of them. And some people had just one or two items. And uh, so I, I saw the manager, looked like guy looked like the manager. I said, hey, uh, what, hey, come here, come here. And uh, he says, what do you want, mate? You know, and I said, uh, you know, uh, in America, I said, you could take this third register over here and you could make that an express lane. And he goes, what do you mean an express lane, mate? I said, well, if you had a person who has one or two items, rather than him having to wait in line with the people that have a bunch of items, he goes through there quickly. I said, you, you'll be a lot better. You'll do a lot more business here. And, uh, and, and I think the people will like it. And he goes, where'd you get that idea, mate? And I said, well, it's like, you know, it's like been doing it for years in America. You know, I said, uh, this is, you know, and try it. If you, and I went back to that store in a couple of weeks, and the guy came and found me, man. He says, wow, mate, this has just been unreal. You know, because everybody thinks that we're really, really cool here, you know, better than other stores. So, uh, so I did a little, that was kind of the, kind of what I, I was experiencing. And we were getting toward the end of, of a three month tour uh, in the second month, basically at the end of the second month. And, and as much as I liked Australia, you get home sick. When you're in another country, Japan or wherever it may be, you get pretty lonely. And especially for, uh, for just the, the feel and somebody, especially when you got a, Aussies uh, speak English, but you can't hardly understand them a lot of times. It took me two months to be able to understand the language. I thought they were talking a different language sometimes, and they thought I was talking a different language because I had that southern drawl, and they were like, and they wanted to hear it. They go, oh, mate, can you talk a little more? You, oh, I like that voice you got, that, the accent, you know? So, uh, so we... Uh, we, we, my, and, I, and I wrestled uh, in the three months. I, I only had one day off in three months. I wrestled uh, 10 times a week. You could wrestle seven shows, uh, seven nights. You wrestled seven nights. You didn't have any days off. And you had three TVs. Uh, actually, you had three TVs in Brisbane every third week. And then you had a, every Friday... Every Saturday, you had a TV in Sydney and a TV in Melbourne. So uh, you could wrestle 10 times a week, and I had him book me 10 times a week. And the guy that asked me about that, he says, uh, you know, how, when I came in first day, he says, how much do you want to work, mate? You know, and I said, uh, how much can I work? You know, I was two, three years in the business. I was eager, man, to learn, to get better. And he says, oh, uh, he says, uh, you can work 10 times a week if you want to work all the TVs and all the towns. And I said, that's what I want, 10 times a week. And uh, he was like, oh, no, mate. He goes, nobody wants 10. I said, yeah, yeah, I want 10 times a week. I'll take all the TVs and all the towns. So, uh, so I never had to spend any time with my wife. And uh, we were there. She'd been there for two months and taking care of two little babies. And she kind of wanted a night out. So I had a day off. So, so for the nighttime part of it, and I'll get to the daytime in just a minute, but this was my experience on the only day I had off in Australia. Uh, at the night, we went to a movie. And, um, wow, <laughs> what a choice of a movie. I uh, don't even remember whether we looked to see and tried to find a specific movie. We knew there was a theater, and we went down there, and on the movie was Deliverance which is like, I mean, Georgia boy, you know, a uh, Southern boy, uh, uh, you know, uh, those that know that movie, man, wow. I mean, it, it was like, I almost got tears in my eyes, you know, at the parts where they were up in the mountains and uh, they had all these crazy hillbillies and rednecks and, uh, and, the, and the people sitting around us were all going, every time they got to one of those scenes, they were going, Oh my God, do you think they like that in the United States? Is that the way the people are? You know, and I wanted to say, well, there are in some parts of the country, man. It really made me want to go home. 
it was like, wow, this is home. I, I, I don't want to go back. I missed it. So uh, during the earlier part of that same day, I took them to the zoo. We went to the Sydney Zoo. And you go across the big bridge that you always see when you see Australia. It's got the opera house that sits right there. And you go to the, the opposite side. You cross Sydney Bay there. And it's a beautiful zoo. Fantastic zoo. And they had so many animals that you couldn't see in the American Zoo because their, their animals were very, very different than what we have in the United States. But uh, anyway, we went to the monkey cage. And it was an orangutan. And, uh, and it was like, uh, it was a big, big cage. So it was, you know, 50 feet across. And, uh, and it had a huge, uh, probably 20 feet high. Uh, it had ropes that were hanging here and there, uh, stuff for the monkeys to climb on. Uh, it had uh, a lot of little baby monkeys. And it had some that were a little more mature. And it had one gigantic, the big man. He sat in the back. He said he watched everything that was going on. And uh, I'd never seen monkeys like these guys. Uh, man, uh, uh, when we went up there, when me and my wife and the two boys, uh, we were we got there, then we were maybe five people there. And, and, and then uh, the monkeys started a show for us. And then and, and, you know, I thought like, wait a minute, they, are, are they for real? I mean, do they, 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 they do this for everybody or whatever? But anyway, one of the more mature monkeys would climb up the rope, and there were little ones, little one would, would come around. He would, and they had the rooms in the back, and the little one came out of the room in the back, and he had his finger like this. He's like, you know, and I'm like, what the heck is he doing there, you know? And then he would go over, and the guy, the one would climb up the rope, and he would reach up, and he'd try to stick his finger in you know where, where the sun don't shine. And uh, and all the monkeys, every time he, the monkey that would was up there, he would climb up a little higher and a little higher, and then he'd be looking off, and the little one would climb up enough that he could get him, and he would hit him. And when he did, the whole cage would go, hoo, hoo, hoo. oh, they all laughed. It was like the monkeys got a big kick out of it as much as the crowd, and the crowd got bigger and bigger. This went on and on, and uh, and when. The little monkey got the boy. Uh, then he, he came down, he'd take off running and the bigger one would go and chase him back into the room. He'd cut him, knock him around. And then he'd go back and climb the rope and here come the little one again. Went on, went on for probably 20 minutes. Had a 200, 300 people there. I mean, everybody was there. Up in the top of the cage in the front, there was a platform and uh, nobody had been on that platform. Big man sitting in the back, all got that big bang, you know, the, all, the, all that brushing, brushing reddish hair on his face. And you could tell he was the big man. And he sat and watched the whole deal. He laughed a little bit too with the little jokes going on. But then he says to himself, you could almost see it in his face. He says, okay, party's over. And he came up to the front of the cage and he climbed up the cage and he, and then he sat on the platform and he squatted down and he just sat there and he looked almost like he was looking for eyes and people, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to connect eyes with you, you know, and he did. I mean, he was, he was really a cool, big monster orangutan, biggest orangutan you've ever seen. And he looked everybody over, big crowd, they were all like, well, everybody, he's got everybody's attention. He's the dude now. And then he reaches back there and he poops into his hand. And when he did, he brought it around in front of him and then he pulled out, he had the big old lips, the bottom lip, and he tucked it into the bottom lip. <laughs> and that place, that crowd of 200 people, they all had their kids and everything else. I mean, they emptied out within 30 seconds. They were all running and screaming like, oh my God, what is this? And I just look at him like, oh, you son of a gun. And he was looking at me like, are, are you going to leave? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was, uh, finally, we left. So uh, that was kind of our experience. Uh, the only day I had it off in Australia. But uh, 
a tremendous time in that country. And I have a lot of friends still in that country that, uh, that connect with me and we still have conversations together. Uh, I have three stud casts uh, that are uh, 65, 66, and 67 is the numbers. And if you want to know more about Australia and my experience in Australia, each one of those shows are an hour long and they tell a little different story about what that country was all about. And, uh, I don't believe I'll be doing probably any more of these on stud stories, uh, but uh, I'd like to say hello to all my friends out there in Australia. And, uh, and gosh, I've got so many of them that uh, have been uh, connecting with me on social media. And uh, I really, really, uh, and you all know how I feel about your country. Uh, and and a lot of you, a lot of you know me well enough to say, Ron, keep they keep they keep asking me to come back again, and I would sure like to come back again someday. And uh, and uh, I'm going to do in my next uh, my next story. I, I, this kind of has a tie-in with Australia in a way. I'm going to talk about a particular wrestler that uh, was a big star in Australia, huge star in Australia. Uh, he was pretty tall like me, kind of long and lanky like me. Uh, and uh, his name was Tex McKenzie. And uh, so in, uh, this is number 27 stud story. Uh, and number 28, uh, I'm gonna do uh, Tex McKenzie. And uh, Tex McKenzie was a star in Australia. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what, what, his, what he was all about. And uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining me for all these stud stories. And uh, I hope you enjoy this one. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you on the next one.